Hello. Um, so in preparing for tonight, I was trying to think of a way that um, I wouldn't just do a typical artist lecture, but talk about maybe some questions that artists and scientists have in common. And I think one of the um, most obvious grappling things that both artists and scientists think about is the question of scale. Um, this is Klaus Oldenburg's binoculars in Venice. How many of you have seen it? Any of you have driven by and never seen that there's a giant pair of binoculars in front of this building? So Klaus Oldenburg famously has always dealt with the kind of classic idea of taking the banal and maybe having us rethink about our relationship to common objects through that sense of scale. Artists like Jeff Koons do the same with puppy and the um, and all of his balloon animals. Uh, this is Curtis Twalst who then goes from the macrocosm to the microcosm and creates these very intimate little tableaus of um, scenes that kind of invite you through your sense of scale to create a kind of intimacy that is very different than what we see in a large scale. Um, Charles Ray maybe makes us feel very uncomfortable with our perception of what our expectations of scale are. This image of family as he's taken the average heights of everyone in a family and then you kind of creepily get to kind of think about scale in that sense. Um, Magritte, another person who not only thinks about scale of the common objects with maybe tying back to someone like Jeff Koons, but also scales of time. and. One of the um, new installations in LA at the Marciano Foundation is a recreation of this installation by Ai Weiwei at the Tate, which makes us think about you know, the scale of numbers. And I think that you know, when you're hearing about images or hearing about numbers in science, I often wonder, where is the point when our brains sort of turn off, right? If someone, maybe Cynthia, Cynthia when you talk about you know, this is 100 million billion, like where do our brains kind of turn off? At the Tate, they originally, um, the sunflower seed installation, this is all hand-painted porcelain recreations of sunflower seeds. Originally, the audience was actually able to walk and lay among the sunflower seeds until they realized that it was kicking up a very fine dust that everyone was breathing. So when you go see it at the Marciano Foundation, which I highly recommend you do, you're kind of kept outside and you get to look in it. So. Um, I think this would be a much more, maybe unsafe, but <laughs> enjoyable experience of scale. Um, probably my favorite example of scale done by artists is actually the architecture team, Charles and Ray Eames, and this 1977 film, Powers of Ten, right? And it starts at this picnic basket on a sunny side by the lake in Chicago, and then it goes up through the powers of 10. So in 1977, which is fascinating, and I encourage you to go back and you can find it on YouTube. You just have to make sure you write the word Eames because everyone has recreated this, right? But what's fascinating about this is that yes, they were using images from NASA, but when they came to the point of not knowing something or not having an image for it, then that not knowing, they would actually either make a painting, create a computer simulation, and so it kind of jumps back and forth between this kind of art and actual representation that they were finding in nature. So um, the Natural History Museum in New York has this beautiful kind of well-known planetarium, the Rose Center, and when the architects were invited to create this, they went to the, um, the scientists and they asked, if you could tell the population one thing about the universe, what would it be? And the answer was that space is big. So, <laughs> the same, and so that's how the architects kind of grappled with coming up with the architecture for that, um, for that um, museum. So then my question is, how do we know how big the universe is and how do we even know what that scale is? And it all comes down to this nearby galaxy called the Small Magellanic Cloud, and this is in the Southern Hemisphere. So if we were living in the Southern Hemisphere, we would have the pleasure of lo not only looking up at the uh, night sky in some of the darkest observatories in the world out in Chile, but there's actually two nearby small galaxies, the smart, Small Magellanic and the Large Magellanic Clouds. So in the past four years, I've created an art piece that's based on something that was discovered in the, one of the Magellanic Clouds. 
So this is a picture from the Harvard Observatory in the late 1800s. And the observatory director, um, then William Pickering, he uh, was taking advantage of the workforce that was coming out of female colleges at that time. And so he imp doubled his staff by paying women left less than half the wages of men, and women were employed to study and classify the glass plates at the Harvard Observatory. So the Harvard Observatory hosts over 500,000 glass plates of the night sky, and they have these beautiful annotations and notes on the, oh, out of, hmm, we are very out of order. Hmm. Here we go, sorry, repeat. Um, so the glass plates have um, all these annotations where using these tiny, strange, little, uh, sorry, Let's go back, here we go. So these tiny little tools that are called fly spankers, after fly swatters, they're really small, but on there they would have different classifications of how the magnitude or the size of a star. And from there they would make these beautiful notes on top of the actual glass plates and in ink. So for this project, Your Body is a Space That Sees, I've been using the glass plates that are specifically attributed to one or more of the women that were studying at Harvard. And this is uh, an image of the Carina Nebula, and this is the painting that I used as a, the image that I used as a reference and the painting that I made of it. So this painting is six feet by six feet. We then, the, the painting itself is actually not on a regular canvas or paper, it's on a translucent piece of film. And then, on the left here is Adam Otke, and on the right, Jennifer Sayo, who are part of my amazing studio team. We turn the studio into a dark room. And on the left, we're mixing chemistry. On the right, we're coating the paper to basically coat a piece of um, like watercolor paper to make it light sensitive. That negative that I just showed you is then sandwiched in between glass and... sprays my water all the time. So this is the positive that of that original um, of that original negative, and this is a gives you a scale install from uh, Luis de Jesus of what these look like in um, in person. So each one of these negatives is attributed to one of the women at Harvard or some of the discoveries that they created. Um, this one here is after Henrietta Swan Leavitt, and it's the Horsehead Nebula. And actually, even though these women were paid less than half the wages of men, they actually were very well known in their time, and many of them traveled around the world. I love this article because they're saying how famous they are, but only one of them is a mother, so it's like, a, like yes, you're great, but you're not a mother. Um, this is the... So this is Henrietta Swan Leavitt, and um, Henrietta Swan Leavitt did something that answers kind of in summary, in my um, now minute and 20 seconds of why, how we even understand the distance of the universe, is that Henrietta Swan Leavitt was studying that image that I showed you, the small Magellanic cloud. So this is a glass plate from the, um, from the archive. And she would print these into a positive and lay the negative back and forth. And what she was looking for is variable stars. And those are stars that would basically get luminous and less luminous over a very, very short period of time. So she was looking for something called the Cepheid variable. And essentially what she did is she thought to herself, if those stars have a period that gets brighter and dimmer within a certain period, and we know that they're all within this tiny cluster, then we know that at least those stars are close to each other. She found that the larger the star, the longer the period. The smaller the star, the shorter the period. If she knew that all those stars were, were together, then that gave us, we could then use those in the rest of the universe to figure out the distance to it. So it was a humongous breakthrough and probably one of the most profound discoveries actually in the history of astronomy. So this is the small Magellanic Cloud after Henrietta Leavitt. And I am going to uh, read you a poem about Henrietta Leavitt. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this is called The Habits of Light uh, by Anna Leahy. That's perfect. The difference between luminosity and brightness is the difference between being and being perceived and between the energy emitted and the apparent magnitude. Oh, to be significant, to have some scope and scale, size and heat. Why not make that obvious, ostensible, stretch it out for all the world to see? Distance makes a world of difference. The universe is made of distance and of dust, more dust than star out there, more crimson than cobalt from here looking, our eyes telling the truth slant through the almost nothing of the universe's finely grained mattering. This is um, one of the a photograph that I found um, in the archives at Harvard of this strange photograph of the women who worked there lining up. And there was between 20 to 40 women starting in the late 1800s that were employed by Harvard up through about 1930s. It was a pretty extraordinary story. And um, to create a catalog for this, I have eight different authors who have invited to contribute something, some sort of writing, and to kind of make a contemporary homage to them. I'm trying to recreate this image. So all of my authors, I've asked them if they would let me make a sun portrait. So I have them come over and then I have them lie down in the sun. So starting from left to right, that's um, Diane Ackerman. Then Rebecca Oppenheimer, who's a lead curator of the uh, Natural History Museum in New York. Davis Sobel, who wrote The Glass Universe, Longitude, and Galileo's Daughter. Jan Levin, who um, is head of astronomy at Columbia and Science at Pioneer Works. And then Maria Popova, who's head of brain picking and has a really fantastic book coming out in the beginning of January called Findings. Um, and exactly at 12 minutes and three seconds, thank you. I'm gonna end with this slide, which is a by way of image introduction to our next speaker. <laughs> I don't think you knew that I had this picture. So um, here on the right is when Deva came to get her portrait made, we got invited to the Carnegie Institute and Cynthia did a fantastic um, introduction to this object, a very, very precious object that the Carnegie has. That, by the way, would not have been discovered for it wasn't our girl, Henrietta Swan Levitt. So hopefully, Cynthia, you'll tell them what this is, because I'm out of time. <laughs>